Hi, I'm Barry Conrad, and this is Banter with BC. Cheers. Cheers to that. <sighs> Love that. That's good. <laughs>And today I'm here with my guest, Erin Mullen. Erin, do you want to introduce yourself to the people? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. My name is Erin Mullen. And I guess first and foremost, I'm a single mum. You'll probably hear my child at some point, and I apologise in advance. Uh, I work in the media, in television and in radio. I have a kids wear line. I'm very passionate about a lot of charities. Uh, love politics as well. Um, very boring, despite the number of articles that are written about me constantly. But yeah, that's essentially me in a nutshell. And to kick things off, we like to start with something something called Two Truths and a Lie. Okay. Do you know how this works? I do. You're up. Okay. All right. Two Truths and a Lie. I lived in Indonesia for eight years. Mm-hmm. I have a tattoo with a four-leaf clover next to my belly button. Okay. I was arrested for drunk and disorderly when I was 19. Hmm. I want to say the first one is true, Indonesia. Correct. And you were arrested. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? No. Oh. I have a tattoo of a four leaf clover next to my belly button. No, I was not arrested. Well, I just kind of thought maybe God. that type of. You know. <laughs> well, no, I'm not saying that I'm perfect, but yeah. no, I haven't been arrested. I'm not stupid enough to get so caught. So I totally got that wrong. That's the issue. <laughs> so I got the Indonesian one right, and that's about it. I love that. I was almost named Dean Martin by my parents. Okay, yes. I. Mate, the fact that you're trying to think, <laughs> I see this is likely to be a lie. My first pet mm-hmm. was a Siamese cat named Toby. Yeah, okay. And before pursuing a career in entertainment, I was going to be a forensic psychologist. Ooh. You what sound you very smart, so I'm, I reckon the forensic psychologist is true. Why would you say that? <laughs> is it not? I could be bluffing. <laughs> well, see, the fact that you're even doing this now is like a mind game, so therefore I think Good it's wine. true. <laughs> I reckon the dog's a lie. The cat, you mean? Whatever. <laughs> the right. cat's a lie. Cat's a lie. Is it? Correct. Yes. How did I'm she win? I'm already ahead. Already ahead. Straight in. Yeah, right. I love Let's that. eat. Let's eat. Oh, this is so good. Bant with BC <laughs> with a very special guest who only eats one fry. Sorry, but it was a 3 p.m. call time. Um, I've had lunch. <laughs> I don't have issues. <laughs> Which Ooh. actor would play you in a movie about your life? Mm, I'd love to say Margot Robbie, but I'm probably being very generous to myself, which I'm very happy to be. Just own it. I don't know if she'd have the depth. <laughs> Margot, are you hearing this right now? No, as in she would have to go to some really batshit crazy places to play me, and she's amazing. I don't know if Kate Blanchett could cover the kind of depth of my life and the yeah, places right. I've gone and the places I've been. But look, if I had to choose someone, Charlize Theron, actually. South African too. Love Which that. I- she is amazing. Even I saw her in an ad a couple of days ago and she just looks sensational. And on the side of a bus, in fact, Eliza will often point and say, mummy, which I'll take every single day of the week. So yeah, maybe Charlize Theron, but I still think it would be somewhat struggle town for anyone to, but yeah, I think if I had to choose someone, it would be her. Okay, Charlize. Charlize. Good call. I'll take that, yes. And South African, perfection. Yep. Perfection. Mm-hmm. Dig in. So growing up, you moved around mm-hmm. a lot, mm-hmm. like around the world. 16 schools? Yeah. So how has that affected your idea of what stability means? It's a great question. I think in some ways it was really beneficial in that I can walk into any room and not know a soul and be completely okay. But I think in other ways, as I've gotten older, you start to look at different vulnerabilities you have and and link it back and think, I wonder if that's because there was such a lack of stability growing up and there Mm. wasn't that consistent friendship group. You know, I'm so jealous of people who say, I've been friends with that person since kindergarten and all the way through school. And I just don't have that. But what I do have is this incredible perspective on the world that it would be very difficult to have had I lived and grown up in Australia. And having lived in a country like Indonesia and particularly living there during 1998, which is when the Sahara regime fell. And, and for those who don't know, President Sahara was in power for 30 odd years, incredibly corrupt, incredibly powerful. And to watch a country stand up finally and say, enough, we mm. want democracy, we want freedom. We don't want a dictator who essentially has given all of his children ownership of all the major infrastructure, the highways, everything else we want to elect someone was incredibly special and significant and was the thing that that probably 
was the catalyst for my interest in politics and in journalism. So to be able to watch a country do that and to be part of it, to be caught up in the riots themselves, we were there when the Trisakti University shooting happened, which is a very famous shooting uh, where students were killed, really awoke something in me at a very young age. Wow. And I think seeing as well poverty, you'd stop at traffic lights in Indonesia and we were there as part of the diplomatic corps. We'd be in our beautiful big car with the driver, we'd have maids and, and uh, cooks at home and guards and the whole thing and you'd stop at a traffic light and there'd be lepers on the road and there'd be women with wow. babies begging. We had two stints, so one when I was kind of 8 to 11, the other when I was about 14 to 17. You're exposed to that at a young age, so when I came back to Australia, I understood how blessed we were. I'd yeah. seen real poverty and real struggle daily and, and understood intimately that we were so lucky to even have a roof. And I think that perspective is something that, that's very rare in most other kids in Australia because we're the luckiest country in the world. If you grow up here and you, you're part of this, this community, you don't see poverty like that mm. because we're blessed. And yes, there's homeless people, and, but in a lot of ways, you're sheltered from it if you live in suburban Australia. So I think it shaped a lot of the charity work I do. I'm very passionate about raising money and raising funds for causes that I care about. And I don't know if I would have had that empathy had I not experienced that time in Indonesia. And I speak the language fluently as well. So yeah, right. not that I've, I've been able to use it much in my old line of work and now my, my current line of work, but it's something that I treasure, that, that ability to, you know, when I, I hear the accent or hear a word, mm. I get very excited if I'm anywhere and I can then practice a little bit. But yeah, so I speak another language as well. So it's an incredible experience, but also one that I look at now and look at different maybe vulnerabilities that I've had over the years and, and maybe that's due back to the fact that there wasn't that stable environment external of our family because our family was very stable. So yeah, it's interesting. Can you give us something in Indonesian? Absolutely. Senang sekali bertemu dengan Anna. Ini makanan aduh terlalu bagus untuk saya. Tetapi saya sedikit tidak lapar sekarang. Tetapi mungkin besok saya akan pergi ke toko dan akan membeli banyak dan akan makanan semua di situ ya. Terima kasih banyak. Senang sekali. That's awesome. What did okay? What did Don't you say? Don't ask me to translate. It was very offensive to you. <laughs> <laughs> no. They said it's lovely being here. The food is beautiful. I've already eaten, so I'm not that hungry. But tomorrow I'm going to try and emulate this entire meal and eat it. And very happy to meet with you and sit with you, essentially, in a nutshell. And you know, I'm actually part Indonesian. No way. Yeah, on my mom's side. Are you really? Yeah. Whereabouts in Indonesia? Yes. So dad's African English, mom's yeah. German Indonesian. Oh, I love that. But born in South Africa, so don't know yeah. really anything about it. But it's wow. always it's always special to meet people. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Isn't that funny? Is he? Do you speak yeah. Bahasa? No. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Oh my God, I can't believe you guys that? both have Indian in you and I'm the know. fluent speaker here. I love that. I can speak both. That's brilliant. <laughs> That's great. It's so funny yeah. when people, when we lived in We're Indonesia. Yeah, I love, I love that. <laughs> but they would, you know, I'm like this, we call it Orang Bule, which is, you know, they're kind of slang for white people. And then all of a sudden, because mum and dad were so incredible with wanting us to not be, you know, these snobby kids who learnt Indonesian in these, you know, five-star hotels or schools, mum hmm. and dad would make us actually go out to the community, go to the market, it's like, so my Indonesian is very slang Indonesian as opposed to textbook nice. Indonesian. So it means that I can actually speak it with an accent and, yeah. and day to day as opposed to, you know, knowing it in a way that's just not effective. So. Orambula? Orang, orang bole. Orang bole. Bole. Yeah. Orang bole. Yeah. There you go. And I think it's maybe, maybe it's slightly derogatory about us annoying white folk, but orang bole is, orang is what bole. they say. What's the biggest stereotype surrounding your work and what you do? Oh, another great question. God, you're going to take my job soon with these great questions. You know what? So when I was in sport, hosting mm. sport, which is what I've spent the majority of my career doing, I think I was the first woman to sit on that footy show panel full time for a prolonged period. The same as Sunday footy show, same as the continuous call team on 2GB. So a lot of firsts when it came to women in rugby league. And I think, you know, something that I encountered a fair bit and particularly things that were written online, that I was doing that essentially to date footballers or to meet footballers. I think that was a real misconception and a stereotype in those mm. early days. I, I think that's, well, I hope it's pretty much dead in the water now. I think we've come such a long way since I started, which was 10 years ago now. And you look at the landscape of, of women on television in hosting roles who are incredible, women commentating, former players who are offering so, so much. But when I started out doing that, there were very few, if, if, if none, in that field and that was, a fair bit of, of the kind of abuse that I get online was surrounded, you know, based on those kind of 
thoughts. I think that if, you know, if you're semi-attractive or mm. you're blonde, then, you know, you've got no substance and you don't know what you're talking about, that you're there because you've, you know, screwed people, essentially. That was written a lot when I first started. And I think as time goes on and people started to understand that, A, you're capable because Channel 9 are not a charity and I would never have been given that role had I not been really well suited to it and very good at it because there's a lot of people around who would have been desperate for it. Mm. So I think the, the more that people get to see you, the more they understand that, that you do deserve to be there. But, but early on, there was definitely those kind of things thrown around. And, you know, when you've worked your ass off and when you've worked so hard for so long, when you've been rejected a million, million, million times over and over and mm. constantly sought to improve yourself and, and not taking anything personally and consistently gone back and back and tried and tried and tried, to then finally get an opportunity and have people dismiss you in that way was pretty hard early on, but you learn very early on in our line of work that as long as you know who you are, as long as your bosses are happy, as long as you're doing work that, that fills your cup and that, that is of substance and of value, and people are willing to watch it or willing to listen to it, then you know you couldn't give a tinker's cuss what you're anyone right. else thinks or what anyone else says. But yeah, I think that stereotype was very prominent early on, but I, I couldn't imagine it would exist now really in any kind of normal people's minds because it's just so ridiculously pathetic you'd hope not you'd hope you know, not at this point. and you look at the matildas and you look at not just women mm. commentating on sport but women playing sport now and how far that's come and, and how much of a an insatiable appetite there seems to be for women in, in these kind of roles on tv radio and the media it blows your mind and and how impressive they are as well you know no one's there for tokenistic reasons right. you know maybe that's happened in the past and i'm sure it's happened in every, every field but no more no longer mm. there's too much competition there's too much talent you know networks they're driven by ratings they're driven by people people wanting to watch and people want to watch competent people who are very good at what they do and love what they do and if you don't tick those boxes you don't get a Guernsey. So what's the most spontaneous thing you've ever done? Okay well once mm. I was drinking with my best girlfriend Kimmy uh, and we decided to fly to Adelaide that night to watch cricket that ended because her boyfriend at the time was working on the cricket and we called in sick to work we were a few glasses in we showed up to the airport happy I uh, got caught off cut off potentially in the airport lounge and as we flew in over Adelaide the lights of Adelaide over went out we missed the cricket anyway but it was very spontaneous very silly but the stupidest thing I've ever done and the most incredible prior to having my child the Sydney to Hobart I did that right. first year and this is people die in this race and I'm not an athlete by any stretch of the imagination but decided to go to raise money for charity. We hit the bass straight, nearly died, like ridiculous massive seas, the boat got battered, it was terrifying. I spent the whole time just shaking, physically ill, it was awful, came back. I went the next year again despite again. having nearly died. And I don't exaggerate when I say we nearly died. We genuinely nearly died, but I had to get to Hobart. I'm so competitive that I had to get there. And because we'd failed, in my mind we'd failed, I couldn't have left it at that. So the next year they went again, the boat, and took me as the only celebrity, because the year before they'd had about six celebrities on to raise money for charity. And they took a serious team, let me come along. I did all the shittest jobs, gave them water, picked up rubbish, sunscreen, just did all the crap jobs so that the real sailors could do their job. And we won, broke the world record, and I was the fastest woman to ever sail the city into Hobart. So that's the craziest thing what? I've ever done. And it was, cheers to that. Cheers to that cheers because to that. so much of my career had been spent hosting yeah. and covering these incredible sporting events like Boxing Day Test with the cricket, State of Origin, NRL Grand Finals, all these amazing things, the tennis, the Australian Open Final. But I'd never actually been part of something myself and to be part of this world-class sporting event and then to win it and to come in and to have crowds cheering and to experience that even in my such minor, ridiculous, pathetic role was so incredible. So that was amazing. That's amazing. It was very cool. And look, I feel the need to remind people about it often, like on yeah. radio with Husey every morning, if someone might ring up and say, oh, I've just put the, the you know, my child in the bath. And I'll hmm. say, oh, the bath, that reminds me of that time <laughs> I won the Sydney to Hobart. Or someone will talk so, about wine. I'll say, I love yeah. wine from the Hobart region. Yeah. Oh God, that reminds, like, I, cause no one asked me about it anymore. So I constantly bring it up, but if that's my only flaw, <laughs> so be it. It's not my only flaw. I've got thousands. <laughs> Hundreds, not thousands. <laughs> oh my god, this wine's really good. Mm. <laughs> this little cocktail also comes with oh, chill. Oh my god, help me. Come on. So you've endured some pretty brutal, horrific abuse online, online yes. trolling, which ultimately led to the Online Safety Act being passed by Parliament in 2021. 
was the pivotal incident that helped you to get behind that? And what does being an advocate of cyber, anti-cyber bullying mean to you? This is probably one of my favorite topics to talk about, apart mm -hmm. from my little girl. And I, I guess she was probably, in some ways, unbeknownst, the catalyst. There, there were two crucial events for me. And, and I'll preface it by saying, you know, when I started out, I remember my first ever night on the Thursday Night Footy Show, and that was my first foray into prime time, uh, a national profile, and, and it was my first experience of cyberbullying, and I, I was completely unprepared, had no idea that it would come. I finished my segment, and I'm very self-deprecating, but I nailed it, did a brilliant job, got nothing wrong, and then I checked Twitter, mm. and all of a sudden, the flood of insults was so overwhelming. And what struck me early on was that it had nothing to do with what I'd said. No one had said that I'd gotten it wrong or that I was incompetent or that I didn't know my stuff. It was insults regarding my gender, the fact that I hadn't played what I looked like, and it was vile. It wasn't just, you're ugly. Because, you know, that's mean, but God, we're, we're big boys, big girls. We mm. can, you know, you work in the media, you work in the spotlight. That's going to exist, fine. Fair play, not nice, but who cares? Yes, okay, good girl, baby. But when I started to, to read through, and, and I now, of course, don't look at anything, but back then I had no idea what was going on. You know, there were threats to rape me, threats to kill me, and I'm going, what the hell? I've literally just done my job on a television show talking about sport, and I'm having death threats come at me. And for the first, say, five, six years, I lived with that daily. And I never spoke about it when journalists would ask me about it because other people would see it. I'd be so embarrassed because I, I felt like it was almost, there was this perception that everyone hated me and, and I was so embarrassed. So I never spoke about it and I didn't want to look like I was seeking attention. I didn't want to be a victim. I was in a bloke's world with all these footy players. I never wanted to be the one singled out as being bullied or, or anything like that. And a lot of it was, was embarrassing and hurtful, the things that were being said about what I looked like and, and sexually, things that people wanted to do to me sexually. It was just awful. So for the first five or six years, I just ignored it and that was the advice I got consistently from people was just completely ignore it same as from my dad you know dad would say just completely ignore it who cares blah 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 and then I remember being pregnant with my daughter and getting messages from someone telling me that they were going to rape my unborn child and I was heavily pregnant at the time I was quite sick during my pregnancy I was also being stalked and followed by someone who was then subsequently charged in court and I remember just parking my car underneath and just shaking mm. and for the first time in my life feeling physically threatened by things that were written online and at that stage I thought you know what I'm happy to be told I'm ugly I'm happy for someone to say they don't like me I'm happy for someone to say that I suck at my job absolutely I don't know why as in mm. keep it to yourself say it to your partner why you've got to send it to me but whatever but what I'm not willing to be subjected to and to put up with is someone threatening to rape my unborn child and I went nah and I went to the police and I, I looked at all the options available they ended up charging this bloke but really what what they were able to do was so restricted because these laws did not exist that protected people online mm. and what I was asking for was nothing different than what already exists in the real world. I'm not a princess, I am tough as nails. My dad was a major general in the army. It takes a lot to hurt me and I was subjected to horrific things that I survived for many, many years. But I thought, nah, if you're not allowed to walk up to me in the street and say I'm gonna rape your unborn child, you should not be able to do it online. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was starting to impact how I live day to day, I was living in fear for my safety, for my child's safety. And so I remember being on radio and I've been mulling this, I've gone to the police and I've been thinking, what can I possibly do? And all these people, oh, just ignore it, just get offline. No, being online is part of my job. Being on Instagram is part of my job. Why should I get offline when these perpetrators, and they are perpetrators, these vile humans who are sending me rape threats can stay online, but the solution that society thinks is acceptable is that I should get offline? Hmm. That's utterly ridiculous. And I remember Anthony Seabold, who's now a very good friend of mine who was at the Broncos, and he's not even on social media, so people's whole thing of get offline, get offline. Yeah. That doesn't work. He's not on social media. His wife and children were being sent things re threats, being told that he was having sex with players, that he was doing drugs, all these horrific things that were ruining their lives were written online and he wasn't even online. So the whole thing of just get offline does not make a difference. And that's when I went, nah. And I, I was on Jonesy and Amanda in the morning mm. and just unleashed. And it's the first time I've ever gone off about it. And I did it in what I, I hope was still a measured and respectful way, but I said enough. 
I said, enough of this shit. You know, we are all, you have to be resilient, you have to be adults, you have to understand in, in the public eye there's elements that you can't control and they're mm. going to hurt. That's completely fine. I get paid handsomely, very handsomely to do a job that I love. How lucky am I? But you do not pay me enough. No one pays anyone enough to be fearful for your life or to be subjected to it. So then I started lobbying ministers, the Prime Minister, I went and saw him in Canberra, went and saw the Communications Minister, Paul Fletcher at the time, Scott Morrison in Parliament, and I, I begged them essentially. I said, yeah. you know, for our kids, we need to protect our kids. I'm fine now. You know, there's nothing that anyone could write about me online now that would hurt me. I've been subjected to so much. I'm so resilient and I'm battle hardened now, which is a bit sad in itself. But this is about our kids. I want my daughter to be safe online. I want your daughters to be safe online. I looked the Prime Minister in the eye and said, I want your daughters to be safe online. And pushed and pushed and annoyed, annoyed, and went on every platform that I could possibly get onto to preach this. And the mm. correspondence that started flowing was mind blowing. Thousands and thousands of messages, letters, emails, people stopping me in the street, teachers saying to me, I teach you three, the first two hours every morning is not maths, geography, English, it's dealing with the fallout from the online bullying the night before. And I was blown away, nine year olds. And because post COVID, all these kids were suddenly online. And even if your parents took them offline, this whole, just get them offline. Mm -hmm. Other kids were online writing things that they'd then go to school the next morning and be told and they'd be distraught. And I just went, there is nothing here that disincentivizes people from perpetrating online. There is nothing that someone says, oh, I shouldn't write this rape threat because I might go to jail. They go, I can write this because it's a free for all. All I said was, we don't need laws to clog up the system. I don't want a thousand people in jail. I want laws so that people think and go, wait a minute, there are consequences for my actions that didn't exist before but they exist now so I'm going to think twice before I do this you put one person on the front page of the paper who's been sentenced who will go to jail who will pay a price for threatening someone's life online and you stop 99% of them and that was kind of the, the big motivation and belief behind it and it's you know the more I spoke about it the more hate that I would get the more abuse I would get the more threats I would get mm. but once, you know, I'm like a dog with a bone and once once I determined that something needs to be done and, and I was in a position where I'd been a victim of it so I understood it and where I had enough contacts, my beautiful dad in the Senate, and I couldn't care less. I was happy to use every contact he had to get this legislation over the line and we ended up doing that, which is one of my most, you know, one of my proudest moments. And I took my little girl who was just three, I think at the time, she's now five, with me to Parliament House so that one day I can show her when she's a bit older that she was there for this historic occasion that I think has, has helped save lives absolutely and help make the online space safer for people in Australia. The kids Incredible. in particular. Yeah. It's amazing. Thank you. And that leads me to your documentary, The Sky oh, News. Yes. Head is online, Erin strikes back. What was that process like to make and what did you take oh. away from that? Can I tell you, it's keep saying great questions so you you're not going to edit that out because it's very complimentary <laughs> to you I'm sure but I sound like a broken record but it is because I thought I knew everything about it and I thought that I had done all the work I needed to do on myself to be okay with what I'd gone through what it did for me that experience because I'd never really spoken apart from say Anthony Seabold and one or two others but not in great detail I'd never yeah. actually spoken to someone who understood and it's so hard unless you've been through it to understand what it's like because you're not only being abused or being threatened and, and most people have experienced that to some degree but when it's in such a public way when you feel humiliated because what someone is saying about you that is not true or saying mm -hmm. that you know you've slept with 10 players to get your job or that you've done this or done that and, and it's in a public space where thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people are seeing it there's another level of, of humiliation and shame and hurt that, that goes with that and I think for me doing that documentary A it was incredible because it raised awareness and, and it targeted a group of people I think that weren't really aware of what was going on and that's older Australians and so that that was a really big thing for me to explain to them why this matters mm -hmm. because their attitudes and, and understandably so can be a little bit archaic in that space because they're not online as often and they say I'll oh, just get offline but once you explain to them why it matters and why it matters for their grandkids and their kids they, they all jump on board but for me I still felt a sense of shame I think because I'd been told so many times how shit I was, how ugly I was, how disgusting I was, how bad I was, how many people hated me, how I'd ruined this, ruined that. But, you know, that said to you daily, even when you block it, even when you don't look, you get alerts. Even when you, you don't search comments, 
you still see it. Mm -hmm. you, it's impossible not to see it. And when, when I now don't look at anything and that's my coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. I haven't for many years now. I don't look at comments on articles. I don't look at other people's social media. I don't even read my own comments most of the time. And, and that was a, a great way for me to cope. But, but what doing this documentary did was it actually made me, made me feel for the first time in my life that I wasn't weak because it had impacted me. I spoke to two or three people who were so strong so resilient, so impressive, who were essentially brought undone by what had been done to them online. And, and in some ways it made me stop and go, hey, you are actually incredible for surviving it. Because in some ways other people would be quite dismissive of it. Oh, that doesn't matter, who cares? Just ignore it, blah, blah, blah. And so that then made you feel almost that you didn't deserve to be hurt by it. Mm -hmm. So speaking to other people who I thought were amazing, who had also been brought undone by it in some way, shape or form, actually, enabled me to be gentle on myself and, and not feel embarrassed that it had hurt me because I would hide the hurt from it for so many years. So many years I'd be sobbing, hysterical, anxiety riddles, just a mess, but I would hide it from everyone because I was embarrassed by it. And, and that documentary made me realise that there was no shame in what I'd gone through, that it wasn't my fault that I was a victim. And I hate that word because I hate associating myself with being a victim, but mm. it's okay to be a victim because I then fought back and I then made it better and I then stood up for other people and, and hopefully stopped them going through what I went through. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. No, thank you. Thanks for asking. What cheers you up on a bad day? Ooh. Aaron? That's an, <laughs> I'm not going to say great question. What cheers me up on a bad day? Can't you say though, I've done, I reckon, a million of these type of things since I started in television 15 years ago. And I always get asked the exact same questions. This is the first time I've actually been asked different, unique questions and I'm thoroughly enjoying myself. So thank you for actually putting some thought into it and actually, it's, it's actually mind blowing. So thank you. So Thanks that's so a real for... compliment to you. You're doing, it's a, you're doing a brilliant job and this is my craft. So I feel like I can judge you. I'm judging you very favorably. Yeah. What do I do to cheer me up on a bad day? Thank you, by the way. No, really such, such a pleasure. I mean it. If I didn't mean it, I'd never say anything mean. I just wouldn't say a word. Yeah. So if I say something complimentary, I always mean it. Um, what do I do to cheer myself up? My little girl is amazing mm. in that way. And I'm very blessed because she's five years old, does not stop, <laughs> talks all the time, fights with me, hates me, loves me, the whole thing. But she is just a wonderful reminder of how blessed I am in the ways that really matter. Mm. Um, my mum and dad, and my, obviously I lost my dad at the start of this year. So that's one that. less, no thank you. That's um, one less option I have because dad and I had so much in common we were so close he was a, a politician and before that a, a major general in the army and two of my passions are, are politics and national security so mm. we we would talk all the time so that was one way that I would always and if I'd had a hard day at work or someone was being mean to me or you yeah. know um even you know a fight with a boyfriend or I mean, I wouldn't go into details with dad because he wasn't really a details man, but yeah. calling him and talking about the things he was passionate about that he was doing in parliament, uh, the situation in China, the war in Ukraine, Russia, any of those things, it sounds ridiculous, but that's a way that he, I could get out of feeling in a bit of a funk. Um, I love a wine. Always Case love a wine, thank right you so much. Um, my job, you know, I'm really lucky in that work for me, when I've gone through really tough times and I've, you know, a lot of my tough times have been very widely publicized and that's that's part and parcel of the job I do but for me always rocking up and that's something I've always learnt that even if I'm at home under the doona and think I want to hide from everyone I don't want to be seen I'm either humiliated by what's on the front page or I'm angry or I feel I've been unfairly done by or I'm upset or I've had a fight with my partner or blah 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 mm. blah, blah blah I always show up and that for me enables me to keep going. And dad was exactly the same. And I get that from dad, just this, this incredible work ethic that you just show up, you don't let anyone down. So that, that actually helps me get through tough times. Uh, I love, I watch news. It's really ridiculous, but I watch Sky News. I watch the BBC, I watch Fox News. I, I literally, and I read news and I just, I listen to a podcast on Ukraine, Russia. I have this insatiable appetite for information and for news and, and that cheers me up as well. So I need to get into something skanky like Real Housewives <laughs> or something to probably yeah. lighten up a little bit. But yeah, and being with people I love, you know, yeah. being with my partner, being with my little girl, uh, with friends. I don't have a big friendship group. I really don't. Mm. And I'm, you know, very happy to admit that. It's, um, and I think with, with the schedule that I have, I kind of look at, at what matters to me and what I can make time for. And really only a couple of friends that I, I see a lot, you know, my work colleagues are my great friends and my family are obviously friends, but 
there's just not a lot of time outside of that yeah. to have a big circle of friends. So I've got a small circle of friends who I love as well. So yeah, those are probably quite normal things. It's the, it's the ragu, oh it's really God. good. It's a crowd favorite. That ragu is and ridiculously good. Amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, you're the best. And that's special. You're the best, thank you, the best. So, thank you much. so much. That's beautiful. Oh my God, We have to start Stop with it. it. Okay. <laughs> this place, I told you, right? Oh, I it's know. Legit. This is ridiculous. Yummy. Wow, what's your cocktail? Yeah. It's uh, it's something with kiwi, which is I'm a kiwi, so that's yep, good. there you go. You're a rugby union fan. Well, it's a bit, it depends who's playing. Yeah, right. On the day. What about you? Obviously. Yeah, no, I actually loved rugby union and well, well before league, and I was always Richie McCaw rather Cheers. than Dan Carter. Oh, uh, why? I okay, know. Give me three reasons why. Richie McCaw, he's rugged. That's Dan not a reason. Carter's That's not a reason. We're talking Carter's, about skill. Come Dan on. Dan Carter's way too pretty. He's oh, I think we're talking about um, oh, okay, well, the okay. aesthetic. All right. Um, oh, just the way he led, the culture that he created in the All Blacks was phenomenal. Yeah. And I love his wife, who's this beautiful former hockey player. Yeah, right. He's just, yeah. Oh, look, Dan Carter's amazing. Got a great perfume available at Chemist Warehouse at the moment. For a placement. <laughs> yeah, he'll go all right as a, you know, we're doing those ads on radio at the moment. Oh my gosh, that tastes like a frosty fruit. Don't Melted. Let it, don't let it fool you though. No, oh, what is in the alcohol content? I'm just saying. Amazing. You, what life challenge are you most proud of conquering? Probably along the lines of what we spoke about earlier with the, um, the online bullying, because mm. surviving that was one of the toughest things I've done. I think there's been a there's been a couple, but it was interesting. I had, did a panel with another a few girls who had started out in sport and other codes at the same time, and two of them had actually quit because of the abuse that they were subjected to. And a couple of them said to me, we weren't as strong as you to continue. And that also made me realize that I should be immensely proud of being able to continue to, to do what I love and, and what I'm paid to do in my job and my career whilst being subjected to these horrific things that most other people weren't being subjected to. That, that's one thing. And I think, you know, life challenges the loss of a parent, mm. you know, that there, there'll be nothing, I mean, apart from the obvious that would hurt me any more than, than losing dad. And, and I, I remember thinking I'll, I'll never ever survive losing him and particularly in such a cruel way. And mm. to be, what are we, eight months down the track after he died to still be functioning, to still be a mother, to still be working, to, to be doing all these things that I never thought I'd be able to do because I thought without him, I just don't work. I don't function, he was such a big part of my life. is an incredible achievement. And I have in the back of my mind all the time, every day when I wake up and I think about it and I miss him and I want to call him, he'd kill me if I wasn't doing what I was doing and if I wasn't continuing to strive and work hard and, and flourish and, and do all these amazing things. and the less amazing, amazing things that I have to do, like those arduous day-to-day -day tasks that are hard when other things are hurting you. I think surviving that is something I'm immensely proud of and everyone does when their time comes, but it, there's no kind of handbook for it. And it's, you know, there's, I don't think I'll ever be okay again. I'll never be good again, I don't think, because he was such a big part of my life and the way that he was taken was so cruel and, and horrible and awful, but, continuing to try and live my life in a way that would make him proud, um, I think is an achievement. And sometimes I think we don't give ourselves enough credit for just doing the things that we're expected to do. When my relationship broke down with Eliza's dad, going from what I thought my life was and would be, which is being part of a family unit, raising our child together, having more kids, sharing that with someone, just suddenly being on my own, being in a really tough place and having to still love her and make sure she's okay when I was falling apart, is also an awful, hard, tough thing to do. But to have done that and gotten through the worst of it now, I think, and to see her so wonderful and beautiful and secure and happy and settled, I think is testament to that incredible ability to survive as well. So I think in every single parent, every person who's lost a parent, every person who's gone through tough times, to just survive and function sometimes is incredible. And we should stop and give ourselves credit for it, I think, more than we do. It's beautiful. Okay. Aaron. Barry. Wait, you need a sip of alcohol before you ask this? <laughs> oh Lord, help. <laughs> and I don't want you to sugarcoat this. What is your weirdest habit that people wouldn't know? Everyone out there, so many people in Australia know who you are. What is one of the most weirdest habits that you have? Oh, oh Lord. Weirdest habits. 
I have this chin hair that I'm always trying to pick. <laughs> <laughs> and if you watch any clip from Husey and Naren, the whole time I'm like this. Even when it's serious? not there, I feel it there. It's like a presence. A chin hair. And it's honestly, it's one, maybe two, if I'm being honest, but generally one. And it's about there. And I'm constantly, when I'm driving, all I do, if I drive to Canberra to see my mum from Sydney, three and a half hours in the car, the whole time. Is it the one there? No, it's stop it! <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me. I know, and I'm it's kidding, honestly, I'm kidding. and no. half the time there's nothing there, but it's just, I don't know if it's how I deal with anxiety or when I'm nervous or just, it's just habitual now, but yeah. that's something I do. <laughs> Don't <laughs> think it's funny. something more attractive, that's, like that's another the, habit that that's might That's really real. Like I like that. It's, it's good. so real. It's good. Um, absolutely. Um, I'll probably do for a wax, actually, so don't look too quickly. But in terms of habits, I mean, I watch way too much news. I would rather, you know, We need to change that. We need to I get know, you onto something. I need something. to be much more like, What about a show, like a series, not like a reality show, but like I a... feel like when I don't have my child, and when I don't have work to do, I'm so tired, I'm either sleeping or I feel like then I need to watch this so I've got less work to do when I'm getting ready for my show, so I'm more across things. But I should, I've, I have watched a few episodes of that Housewife show. And okay. my God, it actually makes me feel better about myself because I thought at times that I'm batshit crazy and my life is psychotic. But when I watch their lives, I'm like, I am sweet. I'm I am sure you so know normal. some people like that though, right? Yeah, absolutely. Every yeah. day of the week. Could name eight for you, but wouldn't right now. But yeah, that's basically... It's for the after show. And to finish things off, I'm going to hit you with some fast oh God, trivia. You ready? I this, yeah. No, I hate this, but go. Okay. Question number one. Which city has now sunk by 150 centimeters and has the nickname Big Dorian? Okay, you're asking someone who works on Sky News Australia about something to do with climate change, I'm assuming. <laughs> the big durian. What's the city? Oh, God, I have absolutely no idea. Is it in Australia? Is it international? Is it Pacific Islands? You tell me. Big durian. Is it, is it in Indonesia? Because isn't durian a fruit from Indonesia? It's a good drink. Is it Kalimantan? Sumatra? Hmm? Sumatra, Java? No, they're not cities, they're islands. Jakarta? Yes. Is it correct. Jakarta? It's Jakarta. What? You've got oh it. My, yes, because yes. the durian actually yes. tastes amazing, but the smell will make you. But I thought you'd get that straight like. away. No, you no. I like I, no, the I. The smell is disgusting. I've, I've, the smell I've, is disgusting, but the taste is amazing. Oh yep. my god! Yes. Well, you got it. It took okay. me a while, but I got there. Question number two. Yes. In the Australian Army, mm -hmm. who commands formations of division size? holds senior executive appointments within the Department of Defense and is referred to as the two-star rank. Major General. Correct. <laughs> Salute to you, Dad, up there. Which gymnast holds the record for most all-round national titles with eight U.S. championships? Simone Biles. Correct. Yes! I love her, plus <laughs> Nadia Comaneci, plus Olga Korbach, and Alexei Nemov was my favorite ever male gymnast. It was amazing. Oh, I like Svetlana <laughs> Korkina as well because she was tall. I was obsessed with gymnastics for years. Okay, you're never going to get this one. Oh. Which TV presenter <laughs> once ordered Uber Eats six times in one day? <laughs> six times in now, one day. I've got to day. say, the Who headline that? for that was very misleading because it made it look like I was doing other things six times <laughs> in a day. So news.com, Daily Telegraph, Daily Mail, you all got much mileage out of that. Me. And it was, Aaron it sounds Moore. worse than what it is. Six times. I had to order salt separately because the fish and chips came and there was no salt. You ordered salt separately, separately from the servo. And yes, the servo is 300 metres down the road, but I don't <laughs> like to get out much. It. Yeah, I don't, I'm not a big people person. <laughs> Final question. Oh, yes. To sum everything up. Is this, am I four from four so far? Yep. Yes. The process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life experiences is called... The process or outcome of successfully adapting to difficult life challenges or experiences is called. Is it resilient? Yes. Correct. Oh, yes! Yes! God, this five is my five. greatest. This beats the Sydney to Hobart. Yeah. This beats the childbirth <laughs> having her. This beats. What else have I done that's impressive? The legislation, the Online Safety Act. This is my greatest moment. Erin Nolan, thank you so much for coming on the show. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. So much. You're, you're you. amazing. That was so much fun. Thank awesome. you for having me. Thanks for watching. Oh, that was awesome. Yay. If you love this episode of Banter with BC, don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you next time.